Hello, welcome to virtual events on the Mighty. Thank you for joining us from different time zones. In honor of Pride Month, today we have an important panel discussion on the intersection of pride and inclusion with our partner from the Trevor Project, uh, which is a leading crisis lifeline supporting LGBTQ youth and Spread the Word, a campaign for inclusion of all people with intellectual and development disabilities. The panel includes members from the Trevor Project, Special Olympics Washington, and Spread the Word campaign. We have a full agenda, but we have reserved some time towards the end to answer some of your questions uh, that you may have for our panelists. And I will be your moderator for the evening. My name is Smriti. I'm a director of product at The Mighty and also a former crisis worker at Trevor Project. Uh, next, I will ask our panelists to introduce themselves in a little bit more detail. Uh, we have Dave Lennox, from, uh, Special Olympics Washington CEO and President, Michael Libonati, Trevor Project Crisis Worker from New York, uh, Special Olympics Unified Partner uh, from Special Olympics Washington, Emma Moore. Uh, we'll start uh, introductions with Dave. Okay, thanks. So my name is Dave Lennox, and um, right now I'm the CEO of Special Olympics for the state of Washington. Um, uh, but before that, I worked for 17 years on the international level with Special Olympics, uh, doing most of our self-advocacy work um, and specializing um, a lot in the human or civil rights questions that might come up um, in the developing world. Um, before that, I was um, CEO in North Carolina and West Virginia and Missouri. So uh, lots of experience doing that and lots of uh, fun time seeing the intersection of all of this stuff. So my focus today will be more on um, interpersonal and some of the systematic things um, that I've seen um, barriers to um, that our people face, uh, our athletes face uh, when they, there is that intersection of LGBTQ issues and uh, intellectual disability. And I'll hand it to Michael. <laughs> Hey there, um, my name is Michael. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, I'm a social worker. I actually just recently graduated from the Silberman School of Social Work with a concentration in gender and sexuality. Um, I have a specific interest in the intersection of LGBTQ identity and intellectual disability. Um, I'm working as a therapist at the Institute of Contemporary Psychotherapy currently training in their gender and sexuality division. Uh, and I have been a crisis worker at the Trevor Project for a little over three years now. Hi, my name is Emma Moore. I'm a high schooler. I've been involved with Special Olympics through our unified clubs and programs for the past three to four years. Unified is all about creating a climate of inclusion and acceptance in schools through um, through awareness of people with and without intellectual disabilities, whether that's people playing on the same team or playing soccer and basketball together or having parties, karaoke, eating donuts, etc. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so we have a list of questions for you guys. Um, my first question is, why is it important that we talk about the inclusion of intellectual disability in the LGBTQ space? So anybody can answer? Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, yeah, so um, all of this is, is largely based on speaking to LGBTQ individuals uh, with intellectual disability on the lifeline. Um, and first of all, I think we need to talk about inclusion of intellectual disability in order to address some major uh, sexual and epistemic injustices faced uh, by people living with intellectual disability, and specifically individuals with intellectual disability who are part of the LGBTQ population. Um, we know from research that sexual health can be a major determinant of psychological well-being. And uh, unfortunately for many LGBTQ folks with intellectual disabilities, there are these unique barriers to sexual health. Um, these are barriers like uh, infantilization, being excluded from sex education, 
Um, oftentimes for those who do receive sex education, it's too heteronormative and it doesn't focus mm -hmm. on diversity, gender, and sexuality. Um, and many of the individuals we talk to on the lifelines deal with things like um, lack of privacy, people assuming they're asexual or don't know about sexuality, um, caregivers and health professionals doubting self-knowledge of individuals with intellectual disabilities who are transgender, uh, lack of access to LGBTQ social spaces. Um, there are lots of these barriers and um, we read about these barriers in research and at the Trevor Project, we hear about these obstacles on the lifeline all the time. Uh, and they cause feelings of shame, sadness, okay. embarrassment, fear. Um, and going back to the issue of health, it has been shown again and again that marginalized and oppressed groups experience greater incidence of stress based on okay. things like um, race, sexuality, gender, uh, disability. And uh, these higher levels of stress lead to negative out health outcomes and huge, huge health disparities between groups. Um, and for people with intellectual disabilities um, who identify as LGBTQ, we're talking about at least two of these marginalized identities, oftentimes more uh, if you tie in race, for example. So I think for all these reasons and more, it's, it's important to talk about the inclusion of people with intellectual disabilities. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, I would I would agree. I think that um, one of the things that I've learned in talking to our athletes um, over the years is there's an overriding need and desire to just fit in in the community. They just, you know, they they get that people you know, look at them differently. They see them differently. They, you know, the infantilization, you know, that that, you know, even their parents don't want to see them or even think of them as a sexual human being. Um, yet those feelings are very natural for them, and yet they 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 strive for a place to fit in, um, and don't sometimes frequently don't know how to articulate it. That you know this is this is what I'm feeling, and then when they do, sometimes they really hit some obstacles about you know well is that okay? Is it not okay? Um, and so I think the the idea that we're talking about this and keeping things so that we keep the focus on everyone needs to be inclusive, um, but um, we need to help this population as much as we can with finding ways to to fit in and put all these feelings into context because they're you know they're all over the map you know and it is sometimes you know sometimes I identify as gay sometimes I identify as a father sometimes I identify as you know a crazy person who's just you know loves to have fun so um helping them understand that um is easiest done when they're in an inclusive and safe environment where they can talk and have friends around them that they trust to open up to and be able to talk about what they're feeling and how they might want to fit in thank you dave um piggybacking off of what michael and dave have said uh there's like there's always this assumption that whenever you're talking about um, LGBT, that they're neurotypical, um, or in general, the world we live in is built for neurotypical people or people without intellectual disabilities. And so I myself struggled a lot with trying to find out, you know, if I was a lesbian, if I really, if I was, um, maybe I was straight or I, or, and then eventually blah, coming to the um, acceptance that I was bisexual and feel comfortable with that, all the resources I had were, were built for someone like me without intellectual disabilities. And in the fact of like media, we'll, we will see people who are LGBT, uh, but not a lot of them are disabled. And so you don't see a lot of people talking about it. And that's why it's important for us to talk about it, this intersection. Thank you. Yeah, I think those are important, very important points that you guys brought up. Um, what do you want people to know about having an intellectual disability and identifying as LGBTQ? I think, I think for me, the one thing when I saw that question, I was like, both, you know, both are a part of who we are. Um, if you're a person with intellectual disability, you know, being, being gay is, is part of who you are. And so is having an intellectual disability, but neither is all of who you are. Yes. Um, 
So it's it's you know it's it's funny because it, people tend to want, think want to to put you in a box. They want to label you and say, well, this is what you are, and this is and this is what you are to me. But what matters is is who you are right then, um, to you, and what's important to you, and that it's okay that sometimes the primary thing that you're identifying with is being LGBTQ, or and sometimes it's you know being a person with intellectual disability, and sometimes it's neither of those. Um, and that that's okay. So I think people need to understand that um, while it's a hot button issue, um, it's a personal issue and it, and it morphs over time, just like with all of us. And so our population has the same issues. And Michael's back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I apologize. I disappeared for a second. So, so please forgive me if I repeat anything that people have already said. Um, but we were talking about um, what we want people to know about having an intellectual disability and identifying as LGBTQ. Um, yeah, so, um, well, for me, I can, I can really only go by what I've heard from callers with uh, an intellectual disability and also what I've read from the perspectives of individuals with intellectual disabilities or LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. um, so going off of that, um, I mean, <laughs> there's a lot, but I think I can focus on a, a few key points. And one that I mentioned before is that many of these individuals feel that their level of sexual education is insufficient and any resources that are offered um, lack information about sexual orientation and gender specifically. Um, another is that many LGBTQ individuals with intellectual disabilities uh, want more opportunities to serve as experts on their own experience. Um, for parents, for caregivers, for health professionals, um, to convey the most respectful and dignifying ways to offer support. Um, I mean, there's a huge, huge credibility excess for health workers and caregivers and credibility deficit for people with intellectual disabilities when it comes to talking about the experience of having mm -hmm. uh, an intellectual disability and identifying as LGBTQ. So there's definitely a need to uh, censor the voices and the lived experiences of people mm -hmm. with intellectual disability who identify as LGBTQ. Um, and lastly, another thing we hear a lot about is that many people in the LGBTQ population with an intellectual disability um, want more opportunities to safely and, uh, and informally talk about sex, sexuality, gender, um, and also more spaces to socialize with other people in the LGBTQ population. So, uh, like I said, there's obviously a lot more than that, but those are those are some of the main takeaways from the conversations that I've had. Uh, all right, I agree with, um, there was the credibility that Michael talked about. Um, mm -hmm. I remember we were discussing um, how a diversity week at my high school, and uh highlight well unified was the how we started it highlighting our like pacific islander club our, our glamour gay lesbian alliance um type of club and i talking with some people and like hey wanting to have those conversations with some of the kids and some people are like oh no it's it's too confusing for them and well that's just kind of stupid <laughs> um you know well then let's make it less confusing it's their it's who they are although not entire like all of them it's a part of them and they deserve to understand that and know why they might feel a certain way and so i it's uh, another part of that um i'm not gonna say this right infantilization of they people will think that uh people with intellectual disabilities um they just can't understand it. And I'm like, okay, well then that's a problem on our part of making sure they can understand it. Or you're just not taking the time to um, actually want to sit down and have that conversation. And it's just, it's frustrating. Right. So piggybacking on what you just said, Emma, um, what are some of, some of the actions that uh, friends, families, allies, uh, take to pledge to include people with intellectual disabilities who also identify as LGBTQ? Um, with Special Olympics, I know the program, I guess, that I'm a part of is Spread the Word, which 
is all about this intersection between here. Let me move my hair. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> I forget how long it is. Um, spread the word inclusion, which is all specifically about the intersection between people with intellectual disabilities and pride LGBTQ community. And so um, there are some, it was a, I think a link. Yeah. Or there's the inclusion pledge in the comments, sorry. Uh, and then there, um, they posted the link in the comments, I'm stumbling over my words, of how you can activate your school, of why this is important. There are certain um, activation ideas, so mm -hmm. things you could do for your, um, this is off their website, you know, you could have a diversity week, which is like what my high school did and have different days talking about like, okay, this is um, perhaps talking about like gender identification or an ethnicity on Tuesday or something. It just, those actions will just open up the school climate um, to be more accepting and just, it can be a great way to start that conversation. And then the inclusion pledge is something you should definitely sign to. It's a, it's a first step of saying, I am going to educate myself on this. I'm going to be aware of this uh, to help bring awareness and understanding towards that intersection. Thank you. Yeah, and, and if I can add on to that, I think the, when we, we talk about what do we, what should we do? What can, how can we act? Um, and I think it's, we have to act both personally and we have to act collectively. Okay. So personally, yeah, we can we can sign those pledges, but but also, you know, like when Emma talks about people say, well, you know, they, you know, they wouldn't understand. Well, then, as she said, then explain it to them. But we as organizations collectively need to look at how we present this information. You know, if you look if you look at something and and it's it's got you know information on on where to get resources and all that, and it's really wordy. And it's mm -hmm. it's you know big words that made someone feel really good when they wrote them, um, <laughs> but not particularly helpful if you don't read. And so we've we've kind of created a society that values the, you know that ability and, and all that stuff as opposed to the person. And so looking for ways in, when we see resources that are too wordy and you and think about okay if I were a person with intellectual disability would I be able to understand that? Mm -hmm. um, and if not, then you know, propose new ways to do it. I've, I've seen examples all over the world where, where more um, photos are used to explain mm -hmm. concepts. Um, but the other thing is, is just personally sitting down with, with someone and getting to know them. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the action that is the best. If you can sit down and just get to know someone, my friends that have intellectual disability, I see Katie Sanchez is on there, I know her. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's a friend. Um, but just sitting down and discuss, it's amazing when you discover what people know, what they don't know, and mm -hmm. you can have a really, really fun conversation just about all kinds of things. Some of them will be important, some of them will be really goofy, um, but that's a huge action that we can take. And then finally, I'd say, we as an LGBTQ community need to start holding ourselves accountable for being inclusive ourselves. We scream about inclusion, yet how many times do you see a person with intellectual disability in, in our social settings? Um, and how many of us you know, can, can point to our friends group um, that, that we see regularly and include in that someone that has intellectual disability? So uh, we need to put our money where our mouth is. We want the rest of the world, including us, and we need to be doing the exact same thing. It is important to have uncomfortable conversations. Michael, you have any thoughts? Yeah, yeah, to piggyback off of that, um, you know, I I think everything that Dave was saying about these conversations is so true. And it this, this might sound like an oversimplification, but I think that, you know, a simple action allies can take uh, is to commit to actively listening, really, mm -hmm. really listening. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you're talking about these things uh, with individuals, with intellectual disabilities, you know, make sure to use open-ended questions and conversations okay. about sex, sexuality, and gender. Um, you know, maybe most importantly, remembering to include individuals with, with intellectual disabilities in these conversations. 
Um, you know, I, I've heard too many people who talk about how, um, you know, they, they perceive this, this secrecy around sex and sexuality and gender, and it makes them feel treated like a child, and it creates a lot of shame uh, around the subjects of gender and sexuality. Um, I think, you know, another thing that's important is being vocal about your acceptance. Um, this is something that the Trevor Project has actually studied, uh, and they found that you to report having at least one accepting adult were actually 40% less likely to report a suicide attempt in the past wow. year. Uh, so that's a very telling statistic. Um, so being open about your support. But I think, um, you know, also revisiting what I said before, I think, you know, a lot of these solutions lie in the voices of the population that you're trying to mm -hmm. support. Um, so, you know, any opportunities to boost or, or center these voices and these firsthand stories are, are important. Um, you know, with that, I would add that if you're going to read or research on the subject, uh, make sure your sources include firsthand perspectives of, of people who are LGBTQ and have an intellectual disability, that as well. Um, in the recent climate of like having uncomfortable conversations, I also understand that people um, who do not identify as LGBTQ or um, have intellectual disabilities um, might feel scared or feel like they might offend if they're asking any questions. Do you guys, any of you have any advice for um, those people, like to start a conversation? So was it people who have, who are LGBTQ, but not, that don't have intellectual disability? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think it just starts with just getting to know the person. I mean, I very few people that I first meet do I jump into the sex conversation um, right away. Um, so I think it might be, you know, first yeah, get to know get to know people, get to know you know you know what's going on in their life, who their friend you know ask you know who are your friends you know what do they like to do what do you guys like to do together, um, and then you know slowly the conversation gets into well you know what's something that you've always wanted to do that you've never been able to do. And when I ask that question, you know, all over the world, you know, mm -hmm. I've had people with intellectual disability say, I would love to have a boyfriend. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that comes up, talk, I want to have a boyfriend and I want to have a job. <laughs> those, are the, those are the two things that I would hear most often. And that gives you the entree mm -hmm. to, to then say, oh, well, what would a boyfriend be like? You know, what you know, we, you know, those kinds of things. So it's uh, it, you don't jump there immediately, but um, once you are are friends, and you know, I think Michael's comment about open-ended questions are are really really good, um, just for getting to know someone. But once you get to know them, it you know, and once they're your friend, you know, then you know you all uh, have a trust, and you can talk about most anything. I think. Thank you, Dave. Um. So what have you observed of both communities and the support of individuals who intersect? Well, I can say in, um, in some of my travels, one of, the, one of the best places I saw was the Netherlands. Um, mm -hmm. um, I was there for some meetings. It was an Inclusion International meeting the last time. Um, so, um, but I noticed in The Hague, I was in a bar and I saw that it had disability night. And so um, I started to ask the bartender, and they said, yeah, we have, you know, one night a month that is disability night. And so people with disabilities um, uh, know that it is a safe place for them to come. And all of our regular patrons know that there will be people with disabilities, and some of them have physical disabilities, some of them have intellectual disabilities. Um, and everyone's kind of aware and creating a safe space that's supportive of everyone. Um, so I thought that was really good. Um, also, there was a national paper that was put out, um, again in the Netherlands, um, that was specifically for people with intellectual disability that, that addressed, and it didn't, it, it wasn't like an encouraging or a coaching thing, it was just a, when they, like there was an example of someone who was getting ready to move, and so everything was in pictures, um, but it was, this person was, this, this 
guy was moving, but he was being able to move from his family's house into an apartment with his same-sex partner um, that they were going to live together in a supported um, housing situation. And I thought it was really, really cool that that it was considered natural and normal, and but it was done in a way that everyone understood, um, and it was it just seemed like very supportive environment. So I think the more we can get toward that kind of thing, it would be great. Nice. ML, Michael, any thoughts on that? Or? Um, personally, in, in my life, in, in my wheelhouse, I haven't seen a lot of intersection or discussion of intersection. Um, like mm -hmm. I have friends who are LGBT, but they don't have intellectual disabilities. I have friends who have intellectual disabilities, but aren't LGBT. And so I thought this was a really interesting conversation because it's something that I had just never thought about, even though I was a part of the LGBT, LGBT, geez, um, community. <laughs> um, and <laughs> That's why this conversation is more important because you, um, you know, you can be taking steps to be supportive to people with intellectual disabilities. You can be like, I'm proud of who I am, but there's that intersection that needs to be addressed. And because I hadn't seen a lot of it, um, this I, I was very much intrigued by this uh, offer. I guess to be on this panel. Yeah, I think too for Emma and you know for all of us that. You know, we I think we all struggle. We all we all want this. You know, we, we want mm -hmm. an inclusive world. We want and we all want to be part of the solution. And and I think it's it's not something we'll be able to force. Um, you can't force you know, we don't want to force anyone to, you know, come out before they're ready and before they feel safe. But I think one thing that we can all do that kind of leads us is exactly what Emma's doing. You know, she's in the high school. She's there. She's. I've seen her speak in front of the whole <laughs> high school, five high school. Um, so people know her, um, and they know they they know her as someone who is enlightened, someone who is safe to talk to, and that then opens up. And eventually, you you get there. I know. And in my role as CEO here in Washington, I've had probably five of our athletes um, come to me or email me or message me on Facebook to let me know that that they were gay and they you know sometimes wanted to know what they should do and you know you know, they, they don't want to tell their parents um and so kind of helping people through but if you are seen as that person who is safe and that person who um will care about them and give them advice and and be able to to be someone who um who they feel comfortable with, um, I think you'll start to see more and more of that. Um, it's a scary thing. I mean, I'm way older than than you all, and I know. When, and one of the things my generation really struggles with is, oh my God, how did these people come out? You know, we we like we're you know a mess trying to figure <laughs> this out, and you all seem to have it all down. So, you know, it's like. So um, there's been a lot of progress. We're getting there. Um, this is the next area, I think, for us to break through is in this area. And it'll all be by personal action, I think. Yeah, I'm, I got to be honest. I mean, I, I feel like I definitely have more to learn here in this area. Um, you know, one thing I have learned in, in my conversations is that, uh, you know, queer spaces often aren't accessible enough to people with intellectual disabilities. Um, and, you know, there can always be more of an effort on the part of the larger LGBT community to welcome them in, welcome them in excuse me. Um, you know, I, I've heard a lot of LGBTQ people who have an intellectual disability talk about um, financial barriers to accessing mm -hmm. queer social spaces. Um, you know, unfortunately, facing biases within the community, um, logistical barriers, uh, you know, for example, just how to get to and from uh, queer social spaces. Um, also, you know, this is depending on the individual desires and needs, but, you know, they might want somebody to accompany them uh, to a social space, like a peer or friend, um, you know, like we've been talking about, that safe person. Um, so those are just those are a few of the things that have come up in my conversations. Thank you.
Thank you, Michael. Um, on on that note, how how have you supported individuals with uh, intellectual disability who also identify as LGBTQ? Do you guys have any anything to share on that? Well, I kind of did my <laughs> my bit on that. I know. Yes. That before, um, but I do think that. Um, one thing that we can do is we can be activists within our within our communities. Um, we we have voices and we need to be using them. Um, and so th doing things like this, you know, uh, where where it's no longer a taboo subject, um, but also you know just being compassionate. Um, mm -hmm. But like I said, when when I see that you know, like we set up a within Special Olympics, we had to, we hosted the USA National Games here in Seattle um, in 2018. And we had to make it clear to the rest of the nation that we would, we have a transgender policy that values um, gender identity. Um, and we don't care where you came from, you know, whether, you know, you came from a state where that is recognized or not, while you are here in Seattle, we identify you and we, we honor your gender identity. Um, that you that you have so I'm um, doing things like that where you can advocate um, I think um, those are very rewarding when you kind of tackle the the uh, the ad administration or you know the infrastructure and say no it's going to be this way it's going to be <laughs> and uh, and move aside and I got this so I think we need to not be afraid to be activists um, and help um, but but never do it just for we always have to be doing it with um, our friends who have intellectual disability so that we don't um, become guilty of doing the very same thing that we're criticizing others for doing. Thank you. Anything from Emma, Michael? Uh, oh, you want to you wanna go? Uh, sure, I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, in terms of, you know, supporting people with intellectual disabilities who are LGBTQ, um, you know, besides uh, working on the lifeline, um, I'm, I'm planning on working with the Trevor Project's larger team to uh, ensure we can better train folks to support conversations with okay. LGBTQ youth uh, who have intellectual disabilities. Um, you know, personally, I, I've, I've tried my best to pull my knowledge from about the subject uh, from the perspectives of people with intellectual disabilities who identify as LGBTQ, rather than just relying on the perspectives of, of caregivers, health workers um, who do not have an intellectual disability. Um, you know, like I mentioned before, I think it's important to spread the word that if you're gonna research, um, make sure you're getting the perspectives of the population that you're trying to help. Um, and also sharing any resources with people who have intellectual disabilities and caregivers so that they can improve uh, how they provide support to individuals. Thank you, Michael. Uh, this is something Dave pretty much mentioned earlier, um, but like when you start um, showing yourself as someone who is uh, non-judgmental, I guess is the best word I can think of right now when you have perhaps like resources you're sharing about LGBTQ and um, and intellectual disabilities or one or the other yeah people are more willing they know they can go to you without being judged and so that's a, a thing you can do um, that's pretty simple of just like posting it on your Instagram Twitter Facebook whatever social media and just so people know that they can come talk to you and that opens mm -hmm. so many other doors of conversations um, of how you can support that person uh, respectively or how you can open more doors for that person with privilege you may have. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from Joel Marie. Are there references that have direct quotes, experiences, perspective dialogues with narratives from people being talked about that can be linked in the comments? So I think uh, we did share a couple of resources from Trevor and Special Olympics. If 
And if you want to repeat those or add those. Yeah, I think the Special Olympics resources won't have the the direct quotes from people who um, are LGBTQ. Um, they're they're aimed at um, inclusion as a more generic um, concept, um, and specifically working on mostly with school inclusion. Um, so that said, I don't know. Some of them may be LGBTQ, and we just don't know it. Um, so. Um, no, I, we didn't have those, I don't think, in our earlier part. Mm -hmm. um. Um, I think I actually have, and I'm sorry that I, I didn't think of this before, um, a disability and LGBTQ resource guide. Um, and it, oh, and it has go. a bunch of different resources, but I think, and again, I, I'll have to look through it, but I'm pretty sure that it has some resources that include the, yeah. the perspectives of people with intellectual disabilities. So I'd be happy to share um, that. I do know there's another organization, and, and Michael, it's in New York City. Um, you're probably familiar with YAI. Have you, um, the Young Adult Institute? Um, no. Oh, wow. You need to. Okay. <laughs> They're really good. Um, I've been to some of their trainings. Um, it, it's, it started off as the way New York City was training social workers and um, people who were working in group homes or things like that to, um, it was their professional development training. And I've been to their conferences a couple of times and they always have multiple sessions on this intersection. Mm -hmm. um, and they usually have self-advocates um, in those sessions. So probably if you looked up YAI, um, you'd be able to see what they're doing you know, and I know they're still around, So, um, um, but when I was working on the international level, I, I, I went there frequently. But they are a good resource, and it's, and it's very real world. You know, it's not sugar-coated. It's not, you know, sweetness and light and unicorns. It's, 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 it's the real world, which is very, um, very helpful for those of us that are trying to make a genuine difference in people's lives. Thank you. Um, so we can add that later. Um, okay, so in terms of some final thoughts or words, what do you want people to take away from this talk and share any words of support for people who have joined? Well, I would say do yourself a favor and inventory you know look at look at your circle of friends um is it a truly diverse circle of friends um we learn from people who are not exactly like us and do you know how many people um are in your circle of friends who have intellectual disability or who have a physical disability or you know you, you know all the you know all the flavors um, <laughs> um but, you know, and that are gay, you know, you know, get, you sh we should have friends from all the letters of the LGBTQ community. Um, because I think until we do it personally, we can't expect others to do it. Um, we need to lead by example. And so one of the things I'm the most proud of is to, that I, you know, can point to my friends who have intellectual disability, who I will go to the movie with, or I will make sure we have dinner with, or... Um, that I check in on, or I, you know, thank God for Facebook, um, <laughs> you know, to keeping up with, um, because that really keeps you humble, it keeps you learning, um, yeah. and you're enriching other people's lives at the same time you're enriching yours. So that's the one I take away is, this is not pointing the finger at someone else to do something, this is the pointing the finger at ourselves to do something. Oh. That's a good point. Um, All right, Emma oh. or Michael. <laughs> Michael know. was, oh, geez, okay. I was trying to think of something that wasn't just repeating what Dave said. Um, <laughs> That's um, why I always go first. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm old. That. I know these things. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Am, yeah, like, uh, what do you want people to take away from this talk? Uh, or, and, Share some words of support for people who have joined. 
uh, biggest takeaway um, is that this conversation, I guess, can happen, even if it's difficult. You know, people with intellectual disabilities, they can understand the LGBT community and they can understand that they're a part of it as long as we take strides of, uh, Dave mentioned this earlier, of like creating different types of ways to share information, whether that be using pictures instead of words or um, using speech instead of having them sit down and read this huge block of text which no one likes to read. Um, and again, you're, this conversation might be scary, it might make you uncomfortable, and you know what, that's okay, it's okay to be uncomfortable. Um, but just know you can have these conversations, that these inter this intersection is real. Recognize that there are people like this in that world, in that world, this world, whoa. Um, <laughs> despite not a lot of media representation, and they exist, their voices deserve to be heard. Um, yeah. Well, and they have wisdom. They ha they mm -hmm. see the world through a different lens than we do. And it's really, really enlightening if you open yourself up to listening to them. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not you doing something for them, but nine times out of ten, you know, it sounds cliche, but it's, it's you know, more beneficial for you. I've gotten more wisdom from people who the rest of the world writes off as, you know, oh, they don't understand. Uh, you'd be amazed what they understand. <laughs> <laughs> They're just too polite to tell you what they understand because you don't look good in it. I can tell you that. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I mean, I love everything that uh, Emma and you, Dave, just said. Um, and I guess uh, to conclude, I'd like to send just a quick message to LGBTQ young people who have intellectual disabilities and say, um, you are deserving of love, uh, respect, you're perfect the way that you are, um, and you're never alone. You know, the Carver Project is here for you 24 seven, anytime if you ever need support. Um, and you can visit the trevorproject.org slash help uh, if you're ever in a moment of crisis. Oh, I'm gonna start crying. Ooh. <laughs> What oh my God, happen? she's one of those people. Oh no, oh no, we're <laughs> non judgment, non judgment. That's right. <laughs> so I want to thank you, our lovely panelists. Uh, we have Dave Lennox, CEO President, Special Olympics Washington. We have Michael Libonati, um, Trevor Project Crisis Worker. Uh, and we have Emma Moore, Special Unif Olympics Unified Partner from Special Olympics Washington and all the people who joined um, this event. So um, a very heartfelt thank you to all of you. Um, and thank you for sharing your thoughts. I am feeling more enlightened and more ready to take action. So hopefully everybody else is too. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity.